an Attic Philosopher, entire by Emile Sylvester, Part 2 out of 3. A ray of the rising sun lights up the little table on which I write. The breeze brings me in the scent of the mignonette. And the swallows wheel about my window with joyful twitterings. The image of my Uncle Morris will be in its proper place amid the songs, the sunshine, and the fragrance. 7 o'clock. It is with men's lives as with days, some dawn radiant with a thousand colors, others dark with gloomy clouds. That of my Uncle Morris was one of the latter. He was so sickly when he came into the world that they thought he must die. But notwithstanding these anticipations, which might be called hopes, he continued to live, suffering and deformed. He was deprived of all joys as well as of all the attractions of childhood. He was oppressed because he was weak, and laughed at for his deformity. In vain the little hunchback opened his arms to the world. The world scoffed at him and went its way. However, he still had his mother, and it was to her that the child directed all the feelings of a heart repelled by others. With her he found shelter, and was happy, till he reached the age when a man must take his place in life. And Morris had to content himself with that which others had refused with contempt, his education would have qualified him for any course of life, and he became an octroi clerk. In one of the little toll houses at the entrance of his native town, he was always shut up in this dwelling of a few feet square, with no relaxation from the office accounts but reading and his mother's visits. On fine summer days she came to work at the door of his hut, under the shade of a clematis planted by Morris. And, even when she was silent, her presence was a pleasant change for the hunchback. He heard the clinking of her long knitting needles. He saw her mild and mournful profile, which reminded him of so many courageously born trials. He could every now and then rest his hand affectionately on that bowed neck, and exchange a smile with her. This comfort was soon to be taken from him. His old mother fell sick, and at the end of a few days he had to give up all hope. Morris was overcome at the idea of a separation, which would henceforth leave him alone on earth, and abandoned himself to boundless grief. He knelt by the bedside of the dying woman, he called her by the fondest names. He pressed her in his arms, as if he could so keep her in life. His mother tried to return his caresses and to answer him. But her hands were cold. Her voice was already gone. She could only press her lips against the forehead of her son, heave a sigh and close her eyes forever. They tried to take Morris away, but he resisted them and threw himself on that now motionless form. Dead, cried he, dead, she who had never left me, she who was the only one in the world who loved me, you. My mother, dead, what then remains for me here below? A stifled voice replied, God, Morris startled raised himself. Was that a last sigh from the dead? Or his own conscience that had answered him? He did not seek to know, but he understood the answer, and accepted it. It was then that I first knew him. I often went to see him in his little toll house. He joined in my childish games, told me his finest stories, and let me gather his flowers. 
deprived as he was of all external attractiveness, he showed himself full of kindness to all who came to him. And, though he never would put himself forward, he had a welcome for everyone. Deserted, despised, he submitted to everything with a gentle patience, and while he was thus stretched on the cross of life, amid the insults of his executioners, he repeated with Christ, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No other clerk showed so much honesty, zeal, and intelligence, but those who otherwise might have promoted him as his services deserved were repelled by his deformity. As he had no patrons, he found his claims were always disregarded. They preferred before him those who were better able to make themselves agreeable, and seemed to be granting him a favor when letting him keep the humble office which enabled him to live. Uncle Morris bore injustice as he had borne contempt, unfairly treated by men. He raised his eyes higher and trusted in the justice of him who cannot be deceived. He lived in an old house in the suburb, where many work people, as poor but not as forlorn as he, also lodged. Among these neighbors, there was a single woman, who lived by herself in a little garret, into which came both wind and rain. She was a young girl, pale, silent, and with nothing to recommend her but her wretchedness and her resignation to it. She was never seen speaking to any other woman, and no song cheered her garret. She worked without interest and without relaxation. A depressing gloom seemed to envelop her like a shroud. Her dejection affected Morris. He attempted to speak to her. She replied mildly, but in few words. It was easy to see that she preferred her silence and her solitude to the little hunchback's good will. He perceived it and said no more, but Toinette's needle was hardly sufficient for her support, and presently work failed her. Morris learned that the poor girl was in want of everything, and that the tradesmen refused to give her credit. He immediately went to them privately and engaged to pay them for what they supplied Toinette with. Things went on in this way for several months. The young dressmaker continued out of work, until she was at last frightened at the bills she had contracted with the shopkeepers. When she came to an explanation with them, everything was discovered. Her first impulse was to run to Uncle Morris and thank him on her knees. Her habitual reserve had given way to a burst of deepest feeling. It seemed as if gratitude had melted all the ice of that numbed heart. Being now no longer embarrassed with a secret, the little hunchback could give greater efficacy to his good offices. Toinette became to him a sister, for whose wants he had a right to provide. It was the first time since the death of his mother that he had been able to share his life with another. The young woman received his attentions with feeling, but with reserve. All Morris's efforts were insufficient to dispel her gloom. She seemed touched by his kindness, and sometimes expressed her sense of it with warmth. But there she stopped. Her heart was a closed book, which the little hunchback might bend over, but could not read. In truth, he cared little to do so. He gave himself up to the happiness of being no longer alone, and took Toinette such as her long trials had made her. He loved her as she was, and wished for nothing else but still to enjoy her company. 
This thought insensibly took possession of his mind, to the exclusion of all besides. The poor girl was as forlorn as himself. She had become accustomed to the deformity of the hunchback, and she seemed to look on him with an affectionate sympathy. What more could he wish for, until then? The hopes of making himself acceptable to a helpmate had been repelled by Morris as a dream. But chance seemed willing to make it a reality. After much hesitation, he took courage and decided to speak to her. It was evening. The little hunchback, in much agitation, directed his steps toward the workwoman's garret just as he was about to enter. He thought he heard a strange voice pronouncing the maiden's name. He quickly pushed open the door and perceived Toinette weeping and leaning on the shoulder of a young man in the dress of a sailor. At the sight of my uncle, she disengaged herself quickly and ran to him, crying out, Ah, come in, come in. It is he that I thought was dead. It is Julian. It is my betrothed. Morris tottered and drew back. A single word had told him all. It seemed to him as if the ground shook and his heart was about to break, but the same voice that he had heard by his mother's deathbed again sounded in his ears. And he soon recovered himself. God was still his friend. He himself accompanied the newly married pair on the road when they left the town, and, after wishing them all the happiness which was denied to him, he returned with resignation to the old house in the suburb. It was there that he ended his life, forsaken by men, but not, as he said, by the Father which is in heaven. He felt his presence everywhere. It was to him in the place of all else. When he died, it was with a smile, and like an exile setting out for his own country. He who had consoled him in poverty and ill health, when he was suffering from injustice and forsaken by all, had made death a gain and blessing to him, eight o'clock. All I have just written has pained me, till now I have looked into life for instruction how to live. Is it then true that human maxims are not always sufficient? That beyond goodness, prudence, moderation, humility, self-sacrifice itself, there is one great truth, which alone can face great misfortunes, and that if man has need of virtues for others, he has need of religion for himself. When, in youth, we drink our wine with a merry heart, as the scripture expresses it, we think we are sufficient for ourselves. Strong, happy, and beloved, we believe, like Ajax, we shall be able to escape every storm in spite of the gods. But later in life, when the back is bowed, when happiness proves a fading flower, and the affections grow chill then, in fear of the void and the darkness, we stretch out our arms, like the child overtaken by night, and we call for help to him who is everywhere. I was asking this morning why this growing confusion alike for society and for the individual. In vain does human reason from hour to hour light some new torch on the roadside, 
the night continues to grow ever darker. Is it not because we are content to withdraw farther and farther from God? The Son of Spirits But what do these hermits' riveries signify to the world? The inward turmoils of most men are stifled by the outward ones. Life does not give them time to question themselves. Have they time to know what they are and what they should be, whose whole thoughts are in the next lease or the last price of stock? Heaven is very high. And wise men look only at the earth. But I poor savage amid all this civilization, who seek neither power nor riches, and who have found in my own thoughts the home and shelter of my spirit, I can go back with impunity to these recollections of my childhood. And if this our great city no longer honors the name of God with a festival, I will strive still to keep the feast to him in my heart. Chapter Romans 7 The Price of Power and the Worth of Fame Sunday, July 1st, yesterday the month dedicated to Juno Junius, June by the Romans ended. Today we enter on July. In ancient Rome this latter month was called Quintiles V, because the year, which was then divided into only ten parts, began in March, when Numa Pompilius divided it into twelve months, this name of quintiles was preserved, as well as those that followed sextels. September, October, November, December, although these designations did not accord with the newly arranged order of the months. At last, after a time, the month quintiles, in which Julius Caesar was born, was called Julius, whence we have July. Thus this name, placed in the calendar, is become the imperishable record of a great man. It is an immortal epitaph on time's highway engraved by the admiration of man. How many similar inscriptions are there, seas, continents, mountains, stars, and monuments, have all in succession served the same purpose. We have turned the whole world into a golden book, like that in which the state of Venice used to enroll its illustrious names and its great deeds. It seems that mankind feels a necessity for honoring itself in its elect ones, and that it raises itself in its own eyes by choosing heroes from among its own race. The human family love to preserve the memory of the parvenus of glory as we cherish that of a great ancestor or of a benefactor. In fact, the talents granted to a single individual do not benefit himself alone, but are gifts to the world. Everyone shares them, for everyone suffers or benefits by his actions. Genius is a lighthouse meant to give light from afar. The man who bears it is but the rock upon which this lighthouse is built. I love to dwell upon these thoughts. They explain to me in what consists our admiration for glory. When glory has benefited men, that admiration is gratitude, when it is only remarkable in itself, it is the pride of race. As men, we love to immortalize the most shining examples of humanity. Who knows whether we do not obey the same instinct in submitting to the hand of power, apart from the requirements of a gradation of ranks, or the consequences of a conquest, the multitude delight to surround their chiefs with privileges, whether it be that their vanity makes them thus to aggrandize one of their own creations, or whether they try to conceal the humiliation of subjection by exaggerating the importance of those who rule them. They wish to honor themselves through their master, 
they elevate him on their shoulders as on a pedestal. They surround him with a halo of light, in order that some of it may be reflected upon themselves. It is still the fable of the dog who contents himself with the chain and collar, so that they are of gold. Servile vanity is not less natural or less common than the vanity of dominion. Whoever feels himself incapable of command, at least desires to obey a powerful chief. Serfs have been known to consider themselves dishonored when they became the property of a mere count after having been that of a prince. And St. Simon mentions a valet who would only wait upon Marquis. July 7th, 7 o'clock p.m. I have just now been up the boulevards. It was the opera night, and there was a crowd of carriages in the Rue Lepilletier. The foot passengers who were stopped at a crossing recognized the persons in some of these as we went by and mentioned their names. They were those of celebrated or powerful men, the successful ones of the day. Near me, there was a man looking on with hollow cheeks and eager eyes, whose thin black coat was threadbare. He followed with envious looks these possessors of the privileges of power or of fame, and I read on his lips, which curled with a bitter smile all that passed in his mind. Look at them. The lucky fellows thought he all the pleasures of wealth, all the enjoyments of pride, are theirs. Their names are renowned, all their wishes fulfilled, they are the sovereigns of the world. Either by their intellect or their power, and while I, poor and unknown, toil painfully along the road below, they wing their way over the mountain tops gilded by the broad sunshine of prosperity. I have come home in deep thought. But in the happiness of men, do genius and authority really wear life as a crown, while the greater part of mankind receive it as a yoke? It is the difference of rank, but a different use of men's dispositions and talents or a real inequality in their destinies, a solemn question, as it regards the verification of God's impartiality. July 8, noon. I went this morning to call upon a friend from the same province as myself, who is the first usher in waiting to one of our ministers. I took him some letters from his family, left for him by a traveler just come from Brittany. He wished me to stay today, said he. The minister gives no audience. He takes a day of rest with his family. His younger sisters are arrived. He will take them this morning to St. Cloud, and in the evening he has invited his friends to a private ball. I shall be dismissed directly for the rest of the day. We can dine together. Read the news while you are waiting for me. I sat down at a table covered with newspapers, all of which I looked over by turns. Most of them contained severe criticisms on the last political acts of the minister. Some of them added suspicions as to the honor of the minister himself. Just as I had finished reading, a secretary came for them to take them to his master. He was then about to read these accusations, to suffer silently the abuse of all those tongues which were holding him up to indignation or to scorn, like the Roman victor in his triumph. He had to endure the insults of him who followed his car, relating to the crowd his follies, his ignorance, or his vices, but, among the arrows shot at him from every side, would no one be found poisoned, 
Would not one reach some spot in his heart where the wound would be incurable? What is the worth of a life exposed to the attacks of envious hatred or furious conviction? The Christians yielded only the fragments of their flesh to the beasts of the amphitheaters. The man in power gives up his peace, his affections, his honor, to the cruel bites of the pen. While I was musing upon these dangers of greatness, the usher entered hastily. Important news had been received. The minister is just summoned to the council. He will not be able to take his sisters to St. Cloud. I saw, through the windows, the young ladies, who were waiting at the door, sorrowfully go upstairs again. While their brother went off to the council, the carriage, which should have gone filled with so much family happiness, is just out of sight, carrying only the cares of a statesman in it. The usher came back discontented and disappointed. The more or less of liberty, which he is allowed to enjoy, is his barometer of the political atmosphere. If he gets leave, all goes well. If he is kept at his post, the country is in danger. His opinion on public affairs is but a calculation of his own interest. My friend is almost a statesman. I had some conversation with him, and he told me several curious particulars of public life. The new minister has old friends whose opinions he opposes, though he still retains his personal regard for them. Though separated from them by the colors he fights under, they remain united by old associations. But the exigencies of party forbid him to meet them. If their intercourse continued, it would awaken suspicion. People would imagine that some dishonorable bargain was going on. His friends would be held to be traitors desirous to sell themselves, and he, the corrupt minister, prepared to buy them. He has, therefore, been obliged to break off friendships of twenty years' standing, and to sacrifice attachments which had become a second nature. Sometimes, however, the minister still gives way to his old feelings. He receives or visits his friends privately. He shuts himself up with them, and talks of the times when they could be open friends. By dint of precautions, they have hitherto succeeded in concealing this blot of friendship against policy. But sooner or later the newspapers will be informed of it, and will denounce him to the country as an object of distrust. For whether hatred be honest or dishonest, it never shrinks from any accusation. Sometimes it even proceeds to crime. The usher assured me that several warnings had been given the minister which had made him fear the vengeance of an assassin, and that he no longer ventured out on foot. Then, from one thing to another, I learned what temptations came in to mislead or overcome his judgment. How he found himself fatally led into obliquities which he could not but deplore. Misled by passion, over-persuaded by entreaties, or compelled for reputation's sake, he has many times held the balance with an unsteady hand. How sad the condition of him who is in authority! Not only are the miseries of power imposed upon him, but its vices also, which, not content with torturing, succeed in corrupting him. We prolonged our conversation till it was interrupted by the minister's return. He threw himself out of the carriage with a handful of papers, and with an anxious manner went into his own room. An instant afterward his bell was heard. 
his secretary was called to send off notices to all those invited for the evening. The ball would not take place. They spoke mysteriously of bad news transmitted by the telegraph, and in such circumstances an entertainment would seem to insult the public sorrow. I took leave of my friend, and here I am at home. What I have just seen is an answer to my doubts the other day. Now I know with what pangs men pay for their dignities, now I understand. That fortune sells what we believe she gives. This explains to me the reason why Charles V. aspired to the repose of the cloister. And yet I have only glanced at some of the sufferings attached to power. What shall I say of the falls in which its possessors are precipitated from the heights of heaven to the very depths of the earth? of that path of pain along which they must forever bear the burden of their responsibility, of that chain of decorums and ennuis which encompasses every act of their lives, and leaves them so little liberty. The partisans of despotism adhere with reason to forms and ceremonies. If men wish to give unlimited power to their fellow man, they must keep him separated from ordinary humanity. They must surround him with a continual worship, and, by a constant ceremonial, keep up for him the superhuman part they have granted him. Our masters cannot remain absolute, except on condition of being treated as idols. But, after all, these idols are men and if the exclusive life they must lead is an insult to the dignity of others. It is also a torment to themselves. Everyone knows the law of the Spanish court, which used to regulate hour by hour the actions of the king and queen, so that, says Voltaire, by reading it one can tell all that the sovereigns of Spain have done or will do from Philip Roman II to the Day of Judgment. It was by this law that Philip Roman III, when sick, was obliged to endure such an excess of heat that he died in consequence. Because the Duke of Uzeta, who alone had the right to put out the fire in the royal chamber, happened to be absent. When the wife of Charles Roman II was run away with on a spirited horse, she was about to perish before anyone dared to save her. Because etiquette forbade them to touch the queen, two young officers endangered their lives for her by stopping the horse. The prayers and tears of her whom they had just snatched from death were necessary to obtain pardon for their crime. Every one knows the anecdote related by Madame Campan of Marie Antoinette, wife of Louis Roman XVI. One day, being at her toilet, when the chemise was about to be presented to her by one of the assistants, a lady of very ancient family entered and claimed the honor as she had the right by etiquette. But, at the moment she was about to fulfill her duty, a lady of higher rank appeared, and in her turn took the garment she was about to offer to the queen. When a third lady of still higher title came in her turn, and was followed by a fourth, who was no other than the king's sister. The chemise was in this manner passed from hand to hand with ceremonies, courtesies, and compliments. Before it came to the queen, who, half-naked and quite ashamed, was shivering with cold for the great honor of etiquette. Twelfth, seven o'clock, p.m., on coming home this evening, I saw, standing at the door of a house, an old man, whose appearance and features reminded me of my father. There was the same beautiful smile, the same deep and penetrating eye, 
the same noble bearing of the head, and the same careless attitude. I began living over again the first years of my life, and recalling to myself the conversations of that guide whom God in his mercy had given me, and whom in his severity he had too soon withdrawn. When my father spoke, it was not only to bring our two minds together by an interchange of thought, but his words always contained instruction. Not that he endeavored to make me feel it so. My father feared everything that had the appearance of a lesson. He used to say that virtue could make herself devoted friends, but she did not take pupils. Therefore, he was not desirous to teach goodness. He contented himself with sowing the seeds of it, certain that experience would make them grow. How often has good grain fallen thus into a corner of the heart, and when it has been long forgotten? All at once put forth the blade and come into ear. It is a treasure laid aside in a time of ignorance. And we do not know its value till we find ourselves in need of it. Among the stories with which he enlivened our walks or our evenings, there is one which now returns to my memory. Doubtless, because the time is come to derive its lesson from it. My father, who was apprenticed at the age of twelve to one of those trading collectors who call themselves naturalists. Because they put all creation under glasses that they may sell it by retail, had always led a life of poverty and labor. Obliged to rise before daybreak, by turns shop boy, clerk, and laborer, he was made to bear alone all the work of a trade of which his master reaped all the profits. In truth, this latter had a peculiar talent. For making the most of the labor of other people, though unfit himself for the execution of any kind of work, no one knew better how to sell it. His words were a net in which people found themselves taken before they were aware, and since he was devoted to himself alone, and looked on the producer as his enemy and the buyer as prey. He used them both with that obstinate perseverance which avarice teaches. My father was a slave all the week and could call himself his own only on Sunday. The master naturalist, who used to spend the day at the house of an old female relative, then gave him his liberty on condition that he dined out and at his own expense. But my father used secretly to take with him a crust of bread, which he hid in his botanizing box, and, leaving Paris as soon as it was day, he would wander far into the valley of Montmorency, the wood of Meudon, or among the windings of the Marne, excited by the fresh air, the penetrating perfume of the growing vegetation. Or the fragrance of the honeysuckles, he would walk on until hunger or fatigue made itself felt. Then he would sit under a hedge or by the side of a stream, and would make a rustic feast by turns on watercresses, with strawberries and blackberries picked from the hedges. He would gather a few plants, read a few pages of Florian. Then, in greatest vogue of Jessner, who was just translated, or of Jean Jack, of whom he possessed three old volumes, the day was thus passed alternately in activity and rest, in pursuit and meditation, until the declining sun warned him to take again the road to Paris, where he would arrive, his feet torn and dusty, but his mind invigorated for a whole week. One day, as he was going toward the wood of Viroflay, he met 
close to it, a stranger who was occupied in botanizing and in sorting the plants he had just gathered. He was an elderly man with an honest face but his eyes, which were rather deep set under his eyebrows, had a somewhat uneasy and timid expression. He was dressed in a brown cloth coat, a gray waistcoat, black breeches, and worsted stockings, and held an ivory-headed cane under his arm. His appearance was that of a small retired tradesman who was living on his means, and rather below the golden mean of Horace. My father, who had great respect for age, in doing so, a plant he held fell from his hand. The stranger stooped to take it up, and recognized it. It is a Deuteria heptophilos, said he. I have not yet seen any of them in these woods. Did you find it near here, sir? My father replied that it was to be found in abundance on the top of the hill. Toward Severs, as well as the great Lazarpitium, that, too, repeated the old man more briskly. Ah, I shall go and look for them. I have gathered them formerly on the hillside of Robela. My father proposed to take him. The stranger accepted his proposal with thanks and hastened to collect together the plants he had gathered. But all of a sudden he appeared seized with a scruple. He observed to his companion that the road he was going was halfway up the hill and led in the direction of the castle of the Dames Royales at Bellevue. That by going to the top he would consequently turn out of his road, and that it was not right he should take this trouble for a stranger. My father insisted upon it with his habitual good nature, but the more eagerness he showed, the more obstinately the old man refused. It even seemed to my father that his good intention at last excited his suspicion. He therefore contented himself with pointing out the road to the stranger, whom he saluted, and he soon lost sight of him. Many hours passed by, and he thought no more of the meeting. He had reached the copses of Chavel, where, stretched on the ground in a mossy glade, he read once more the last volume of Emile. The delight of reading it had so completely absorbed him that he had ceased to see or hear anything around him. With his cheeks flushed and his eyes moist, he repeated aloud a passage which had particularly affected him. An exclamation uttered close by him awoke him from his ecstasy. He raised his head and perceived the tradesman-looking person he had met before on the crossroad at Viraflay. He was loaded with plants, the collection of which seemed to have put him into high good humor. A thousand thanks, sir, said he to my father. I have found all that you told me of, and I am indebted to you for a charming walk. My father respectfully rose and made a civil reply. The stranger had grown quite familiar, and even asked if his young brother botanist did not think of returning to Paris. My father replied in the affirmative, and opened his tin box to put his book back in it. The stranger asked him with a smile if he might without impertinence ask the name of it. My father answered that it was Rousseau's Emile. The stranger immediately became grave. They walked for some time side by side, my father expressing with the warmth of a heart still throbbing with emotion. All that this work had made him feel, his companion remaining cold and silent. 
The former extolled the glory of the great Genovese writer, whose genius had made him a citizen of the world. He expatiated on this privilege of great thinkers who reign in spite of time and space, and gather together a people of willing subjects out of all nations. But the stranger suddenly interrupted him, and how do you know, said he mildly, whether Jean Jack would not exchange the reputation which you seem to envy for the life of one of the woodcutters whose chimneys smoke we see, what has fame brought him except persecution? The unknown friends whom his books may have made for him content themselves with blessing him in their hearts. While the declared enemies that they have drawn upon him pursue him with violence and calumny, his pride has been flattered by success. How many times has it been wounded by satire, and be assured that human pride is like the Sybarite, who was prevented from sleeping by a crease in a rose-leaf? The activity of a vigorous mind, by which the world profits, almost always turns against him who possesses it. He expects more from it as he grows older. The ideal he pursues continually disgusts him with the actual. He is like a man who, with a too refined sight, discerns spots and blemishes in the most beautiful face. I will not speak of stronger temptations and of deeper downfalls. Genius, you have said, is a kingdom, but what virtuous man is not afraid of being a king? He who feels only his great powers is with the weaknesses and passions of our nature preparing for great failures. Believe me, sir, the unhappy man who wrote this book is no object of admiration or of envy. But, if you have a feeling heart, pity him. My father, astonished at the excitement with which his companion pronounced these last words, did not know what to answer. Just then they reached the paved road which led from Mudon Castle to that of Versailles. A carriage was passing. The ladies who were in it perceived the old man, uttered an exclamation of surprise, and leaning out of the window repeated, There is Jean Jack, there is Rousseau. Then the carriage disappeared in the distance. My father remained motionless, confounded and amazed, his eyes wide open, and his hands clasped. Rousseau, who had shuddered on hearing his name spoken, turned toward him. You see, said he, with the bitter misanthropy which his later misfortunes had produced in him, Jean Jack cannot even hide himself. He is an object of curiosity to some, of malignity to others, and to all he is a public thing at which they point the finger. It would signify less if he had only to submit to the impertinence of the idol, but as soon as a man has had the misfortune to make himself a name, he becomes public property. Every one rakes into his life, relates his most trivial actions, and insults his feelings. He becomes like those walls which every passer-by may deface with some abusive writing. Perhaps you will say that I have myself encouraged this curiosity by publishing my confessions. But the world forced me to it. They looked into my house through the blinds, and they slandered me. I have opened the doors and windows, so that they should at least know me such as I am. Adieu, sir. Whenever you wish to know the worth of fame, remember that you have seen Rousseau. Nine o'clock. Ah, now I understand my father's story. It contains the answer to one of the questions I asked myself a week ago. Yes, I now feel that fame and power are gifts that are dearly bought, and that, when they dazzle the soul, 
Both are oftenest, as Madame de Stael says, but unduil a clatent de bonheur. Tis better to be lowly born, and range with humble livers in content, than to be perched up in a glistering grief, and wear a golden sorrow. Chapter Roman 8 Misanthropy and Repentance August 3, 9 o'clock p.m. There are days when everything appears gloomy to us. The world, like the sky, is covered by a dark fog. Nothing seems in its place. We see only misery, improvidence, and cruelty. The world seems without God, and given up to all the evils of chance. Yesterday I was in this unhappy humor. After a long walk in the Faubourgs, I returned home sad and dispirited. Everything I had seen seemed to accuse the civilization of which we are so proud. I had wandered into a little by-street, with which I was not acquainted, and I found myself suddenly in the middle of those dreadful abodes where the poor are born. To languish and die, I looked at those decaying walls, which time has covered with a foul leprosy. Those windows, from which dirty rags hang out to dry, those fetid gutters, which coil along the fronts of the houses like venomous reptiles, I felt oppressed with grief, and hastened on. A little farther on I was stopped by the hearse of a hospital, a dead man, nailed down in his deal coffin, was going to his last abode, without funeral pomp or ceremony, and without followers. There was not here even that last friend of the outcast, the dog, which a painter has introduced as the sole attendant at the pauper's burial. He whom they were preparing to commit to the earth was going to the tomb. As he had lived, alone, doubtless no one would be aware of his end. In this battle of society, what signifies a soldier the less? But what, then, is this human society, if one of its members can thus disappear, like a leaf carried away by the wind? The hospital was near a barrack, at the entrance of which old men, women, and children were quarreling for the remains of the coarse bread which the soldiers had given them in charity, thus, Beings like ourselves daily wait in destitution on our compassion, till we give them leave to live, whole troops of outcasts. In addition to the trials imposed on all God's children, have to endure the pangs of cold, hunger, and humiliation. Unhappy human commonwealth, where man is in a worse condition than the bee in its hive, or the ant in its subterranean city. Ah, what then avails our reason? What is the use of so many high faculties, if we are neither the wiser nor the happier for them? Which of us would not exchange his life of labor and trouble with that of the birds of the air, to whom the whole world is a life of joy? When dying of hunger and thirst, says, as he looks at the bullfinches rifling the fruit trees, Alas, those birds are happier than Christians. They have no need of inns, or butchers, or bakers, or gardeners. God's heaven belongs to them, and earth spreads a continual feast before them. The tiny flies are their game. Ripe grass their cornfields, and hips and haws their store of fruit. 
They have the right of taking everywhere, without paying or asking leave. Thus comes it that the little birds are happy, and sing all the live long day. But the life of man in a natural state is like that of the birds. He equally enjoys nature. The earth spreads a continual feast before him. What, then, has he gained by that selfish and imperfect association which forms a nation? Would it not be better for every one to turn again to the fertile bosom of nature and live there upon her bounty in peace and liberty? August 20th, 4 o'clock a.m. The dawn casts a red glow on my bed curtains. The breeze brings in the fragrance of the gardens below. Here I am again leaning on my elbows by the windows, inhaling the freshness and gladness of this first wakening of the day. My eye always passes over the roofs filled with flowers, warbling and sunlight, with the same pleasure. But today it stops at the end of a buttress which separates our house from the next. The storms have stripped the top of its plaster covering, and dust carried by the wind has collected in the crevices. And being fixed there by the rain, has formed a sort of aerial terrace, where some green grass has sprung up. Among it rises a stalk of wheat, which today is surmounted by a sickly ear that droops its yellow head. This poor stray crop on the roofs, the harvest of which will fall to the neighboring sparrows, has carried my thoughts to the rich crops which are now falling beneath the sickle. It has recalled to me the beautiful walks I took as a child through my native province, when the threshing floors at the farmhouses resounded from every part with the sound of a flail, and when the carts loaded with golden sheaves came in by all the roads. I still remember the songs of the maidens, the cheerfulness of the old men, the open-hearted merriment of the laborers. There was, at that time, something in their looks both of pride and feeling. The latter came from thankfulness to God, the former from the sight of the harvest, the reward of their labor, they felt indistinctly the grandeur and the holiness of their part in the general work of the world. They looked with pride upon their mountains of corn sheaves, and they seemed to say, Next to God, it is we who feed the world. What a wonderful order there is in all human labor! While the husbandman furrows his land and prepares for every one his daily bread, the town artisan, far away, weaves the stuff in which he is to be clothed. The miner seeks underground the iron for his plow. The soldier defends him against the invader. The judge takes care that the law protects his fields. The tax controller adjusts his private interests with those of the public. The men of science and of art add every day a few horses to this ideal team, which draws along the material world. As steam impels the gigantic trains of our iron roads, thus all unite together, all help one another. The toil of each one benefits himself and all the world. The work has been apportioned among the different members of the whole of society by a tacit agreement. If in this apportionment errors are committed, if certain individuals have not been employed according to their capacities, those defects of detail diminish in the sublime conception of the whole. The poorest man included in this association has his place, his work, his reason for being there. Each is something in the whole. There is nothing like this for man in the state of nature. 
as he depends only upon himself, it is necessary that he be sufficient for everything. All creation is his property, but he finds in it as many hindrances as helps. He must surmount these obstacles with the single strength that God has given him. He cannot reckon on any other aid than chance and opportunity. No one reaps manufactures, fights or thinks for him. He is nothing to anyone. He is a unit multiplied by the cipher of his own single powers, while the civilized man is a unit multiplied by the whole of society. But, notwithstanding this, the other day, disgusted by the sight of some vices in detail, I cursed the latter, and almost envied the life of the savage. One of the infirmities of our nature is always to mistake feeling for evidence, and to judge the season by a cloud or a ray of sunshine. Was the misery, the sight of which made me regret a savage life, really the effect of civilization? Must we accuse society of having created these evils? Or acknowledge, on the contrary, that it has alleviated them? Could the women and children, who were receiving the coarse bread from the soldier, help in the desert for more help or pity, that dead man, whose forsaken state I deplored, had he not found? By the cares of a hospital, a coffin, and the humble grave where he was about to rest, alone, and far from men. He would have died like the wild beast in his den, and would now be serving as food for vultures. These benefits of human society are shared. Then, by the most destitute, whoever eats the bread that another has reaped and kneaded, is under an obligation to his brother, and cannot say he owes him nothing in return. The poorest of us has received from society much more than his own single strength would have permitted him to wrest from nature. But cannot society give us more who doubts it? Errors have been committed in this distribution of tasks and workers. Time will diminish the number of them. With new lights a better division will arise. The elements of society go on toward perfection, like everything else. The difficulty is to know how to adapt ourselves to the slow step of time, whose progress can never be forced on without danger. August 14th, 6 o'clock a.m., my garret window rises upon the roof like a massive watchtower. The corners are covered by large sheets of lead, which run into the tiles. The successive action of cold and heat has made them rise. And so a crevice has been formed in an angle on the right side. Ere a sparrow has built her nest. I have followed the progress of this aerial habitation from the first day. I have seen the bird successively bring the straw, moss, and wool designed for the construction of her abode. And I have admired the persevering skill she expended in this difficult work. At first my new neighbor spent her days in fluttering over the poplar in the garden and in chirping along the gutters. A fine lady's life seemed the only one to suit her. Then all of a sudden, the necessity of preparing a shelter for her brood transformed our idler into a worker. She no longer gave herself either rest or relaxation. I saw her always either flying, fetching, or carrying. Neither rain nor sun stopped her. A striking example of the power of necessity. We are indebted to it not only for most of our talents, but for many of our virtues. Is it not necessity 
that has given the people of less favored climates that constant activity which has placed them so quickly at the head of nations as they are deprived of most of the gifts of nature they have supplied them by their industry necessity has sharpened their understanding endurance awakened their foresight while elsewhere man warmed by an ever brilliant sun and loaded with the bounties of the earth was remaining poor ignorant and naked in the midst of gifts he did not attempt to explore here he was forced by necessity to wrest his food from the ground to build habitations to defend himself from the intemperance of the weather and to warm his body by clothing himself with the wool of animals work makes him both more intelligent and more robust disciplined by it he seems to mount higher on the ladder of creation while those more favored by nature remain on the step nearest to the brutes i made these reflections while looking at the bird whose instinct seemed to have become more acute since she had been occupied in work at last the nest was finished she set up her household there and i followed her through all the phases of her new existence when she had sat on the eggs and the young ones were hatched she fed them with the most attentive care the corner of my window had become a stage of moral action which fathers and mothers might come to take lessons from the little ones soon became large and this morning i have seen them take their first flight one of them weaker than the others was not able to clear the edge of the roof and fell into the gutter i caught him with some difficulty and placed him again on the tile in front of his house but the mother has not noticed him once freed from the cares of a family she has resumed her wandering life among the trees and along the roofs in vain i have kept away from my window to take from her every excuse for fear in vain the feeble little bird has called to her with plaintive cries his bad mother has passed by singing and fluttering with a thousand airs and graces once only the father came near he looked at his offspring with contempt and then disappeared never to return i crumbled some bread before the little orphan but he did not know how to peck it with his bill i tried to catch him but he escaped into the forsaken nest what will become of him there if his mother does not come back August 15th, 6 o'clock. This morning, on opening my window, I found the little bird dying upon the tiles. His wounds showed me that he had been driven from the nest by his unworthy mother. I tried in vain to warm him again with my breath. I felt the last pulsations of life. His eyes were already closed and his wings hung down i placed him on the roof in a ray of sunshine and i closed my window the struggle of life against death has always something gloomy in it it is a warning to us happily i hear someone in the passage without doubt it is my old neighbor his conversation will distract my thoughts it was my portress excellent woman she wished me to read a letter from her son the sailor and begged me to answer it for her i kept it to copy it in my journal here it is dear mother this is to tell you that i have been very well ever since the last time except that last week i was nearly drowned with the boat which would have been a great loss, as there is not a better craft anywhere. A gust of wind capsized us, 
and just as I came up above water, I saw the captain sinking. I went after him, as was my duty, and after diving three times, I brought him to the surface, which pleased him much. For when we were hoisted on board, and he had recovered his senses, he threw his arms round my neck, as he would have done to an officer. I do not hide from you, dear mother, that this has delighted me. But it isn't all. It seems that fishing up the captain has reminded them that I had a good character, and they have just told me that I am promoted to be a sailor of the first class. Directly I knew it, I cried out, my mother shall have coffee twice a day, and really, dear mother, there is nothing now to hinder you. As I shall now have a larger allowance to send you, I include by begging you to take care of yourself if you wish to do me good. For nothing makes me feel so well as to think that you want for nothing. Your son, from the bottom of my heart. Jack, this is the answer that the portress dictated to me. My good Jackot, it makes me very happy to see that your heart is still as true as ever, and that you will never shame those who have brought you up. I need not tell you to take care of your life, because you know it is the same as my own, and that without you... Dear child... I should wish for nothing but the grave, but we are not bound to live, while we are bound to do our duty. Do not fear for my health, good Jack, I was never better, I do not grow old at all, for fear of making you unhappy. I want nothing, and I live like a lady, I even had some money over this year, and as my drawers shut very badly, I put it into the savings bank, where I have opened an account in your name. So, when you come back, you will find yourself with an income. I have also furnished your chest with new linen, and I have knitted you three new sea jackets. All your friends are well. Your cousin is just dead, leaving his widow in difficulties. I gave her your thirty francs remittance and said that you had sent it her, and the poor woman remembers you day and night in her prayers. So, you see, I have put that money in another sort of savings bank, but there it is our hearts that get the interest. Goodbye, dear Jackot. Write to me often, and always remember the good God and your old mother. Frosine Milot, good son, and worthy mother, how such examples bring us back to a love for the human race, in a fit of fanciful misanthropy. We may envy the fate of the savage, and prefer that of the bird to such as he, but impartial observation soon does justice to such paradoxes. We find on examination that in the mixed good and evil of human nature, the good so far abounds that we are not in the habit of noticing it. While the evil strikes us precisely on account of its being the exception. If nothing is perfect, nothing is so bad as to be without its compensation or its remedy. What spiritual riches are there in the midst of the evils of society? How much does the moral world redeem the material? That which will ever distinguish man from the rest of creation is his power of deliberate affection and of enduring self-sacrifice. The mother who took care of her brood in the corner of my window devoted to them the necessary time for accomplishing the laws which ensure the preservation of her kind. But she obeyed an instinct and not a rational choice. 
when she had accomplished the mission appointed her by Providence, she cast off the duty as we get rid of a burden. And she returned again to her selfish liberty. The other mother, on the contrary, will go on with her task as long as God shall leave her here below. The life of her son will still remain. So to speak, joined to her own, and when she disappears from the earth, she will leave there that part of herself. Thus, the affections make for our species an existence separate from all the rest of creation. Thanks to them, we enjoy a sort of terrestrial immortality, and if other beings succeed one another, man alone perpetuates himself. Chapter Roman 9 the family of Michael Rout. September 15th, 8 o'clock. This morning, while I was arranging my books, Mother Genevieve came in and brought me the basket of fruit I buy of her every Sunday. For the nearly twenty years that I have lived in this quarter, I have dealt in her little fruit shop. Perhaps I should be better served elsewhere but Mother Genevieve has but little custom. To leave her would do her harm, and cause her unnecessary pain. It seems to me that the length of our acquaintance has made me incur a sort of tacit obligation to her. My patronage has become her property. She has put the basket upon my table, and as I want her husband, who is a joiner, to add some shelves to my bookcase, she has gone downstairs again immediately to send him to me. At first I did not notice either her looks or the sound of her voice, but, now that I recall them, it seems to me that she was not as jovial as usual. Can Mother Genevieve be in trouble about anything? Poor woman! All her best years were subject to such bitter trials. That she might think she had received her full share already. Were I to live a hundred years, I should never forget the circumstances which made her known to me, and which obtained for her my respect. It was at the time of my first settling in the Faubourg, I had noticed her empty fruit shop, which nobody came into, and, being attracted by its forsaken appearance, I made my little purchases in it. I have always instinctively preferred the poor shops. There is less choice in them, but it seems to me that my purchase is a sign of sympathy with a brother in poverty. These little dealings are almost always an anchor of hope to those whose very existence is in peril the only means by which some orphan gains a livelihood. There the aim of the tradesman is not to enrich himself, but to live. The purchase you make of him is more than an exchange, it is a good action. Mother Genevieve at that time was still young, but had already lost that fresh bloom of youth which suffering causes to wither so soon among the poor. Her husband, a clever joiner, gradually left off working to become, according to the picturesque expression of the workshops, a worshipper of St. Monday, the wages of the week, which was always reduced to two or three working days were completely dedicated by him to the worship of this god of the barriers, and Genevieve was obliged herself to provide for all the wants of the household. One evening, when I went to make some trifling purchases of her, I heard a sound of quarreling in the back shop. There were the voices of several women, among which I distinguished that of Genevieve, broken by sobs. On looking farther in, I perceived the fruit woman holding a child in her arms and kissing it, while a country nurse seemed to be claiming her wages from her. 
The poor woman, who without doubt had exhausted every explanation and every excuse, was crying in silence, and one of her neighbors was trying in vain to appease the countrywoman, excited by that love of money which the evils of a hard peasant life but too well excuse, and disappointed by the refusal of her expected wages. The nurse was launching forth in recriminations, threats, and abuse. In spite of myself, I listened to the quarrel, not daring to interfere, and not thinking of going away. When Michael Arout appeared at the shop door, the joiner had just come from the barriers, where he had passed part of the day at a public house. His blouse, without a belt, and untied at the throat, showed none of the noble stains of work. In his hand he held his cap, which he had just picked up out of the mud. His hair was in disorder, his eye fixed, and the pallor of drunkenness in his face. He came reeling in, looked wildly around him, and called Genevieve. She heard his voice, gave a start, and rushed into the shop, but at the sight of the miserable man, who was trying in vain to steady himself. She pressed the child in her arms and bent over it with tears. The countrywoman and the neighbor had followed her. Come, come, cried the former in a rage. Do you intend to pay me? After all, ask the master for the money, ironically answered the woman from the next door, pointing to the joiner, who had just fallen against the counter. The countrywoman looked at him. Ah, he is the father, returned she well. What idle beggars! not to have a penny to pay honest people, and get tipsy with wine in that way. The drunkard raised his head. What, what, stammered he, who is it that talks of wine? I've had nothing but brandy, but I am going back again to get some wine. Wife, give me your money. There are some friends waiting for me at the Pier La Tuile. Genevieve did not answer. He went round the counter, opened the till, and began to rummage in it. You see where the money of the house goes, observed the neighbor to the countrywoman. How can the poor, unhappy woman pay you when he takes all? Is that my fault? replied the nurse angrily. They owe to me and somehow or other they must pay me. And letting loose her tongue, as these women out of the country do, she began relating at length all the care she had taken of the child, and all the expense it had been to her. In proportion, as she recalled all she had done, her words seemed to convince her more than ever of her rights and to increase her anger, the poor mother, who no doubt feared that her violence would frighten the child, returned into the back shop and put it into its cradle. Whether it is that the countrywoman saw in this act a determination to escape her claims, or that she was blinded by passion, I cannot say, but she rushed into the next room, where I heard the sounds of quarreling, with which the cries of the child were soon mingled. The joiner, who was still rummaging in the till, was startled, and raised his head. At the same moment Genevieve appeared at the door, holding in her arms the baby that the countrywoman was trying to tear from her. She ran toward the counter, and throwing herself behind her husband, cried,
Michael, defend your son. The drunken man quickly stood up erect, like one who awakes with a start. My son, stammered he, what son? His looks fell upon the child. A vague ray of intelligence passed over his features. Robert, resumed he, it is Robert. He tried to steady himself on his feet, that he might take the baby. But he tottered. The nurse approached him in a rage. My money, or I shall take the child away, cried she. It is I who have fed and brought it up, if you don't pay me for what has made it live. It ought to be the same to you as if it were dead. I shall not go until I have my due or the baby. And what would you do with him? murmured Genevieve, pressing Robert against her bosom. Take it to the foundling, replied the countrywoman, harshly. The hospital is a better mother than you are, for it pays for the food of its little ones. At the word foundling, Genevieve had exclaimed aloud in horror. With her arms wound round her son, whose head she hid in her bosom, and her two hands spread over him. She had retreated to the wall and remained with her back against it, like a lioness defending her young. The neighbor and I contemplated this scene without knowing how we could interfere. As for Michael, he looked at us by turns, making a visible effort to comprehend it all. His eye rested upon Genevieve and the child. It lit up with a gleam of pleasure. But when he turned toward us, he again became stupid and hesitating. At last, apparently making a prodigious effort, he cried out, Wait! And going to a tub filled with water, he plunged his face into it several times. Every eye was turned upon him. The countrywoman herself seemed astonished. At length he raised his dripping head. This ablution had partly dispelled his drunkenness. He looked at us for a moment. Then he turned to Genevieve, and his face brightened up. Robert, cried he, going up to the child and taking him in his arms. Ah, give him me, wife. I must look at him. The mother seemed to give up his son to him with reluctance and stayed before him with her arms extended, as if she feared the child would have a fall. The nurse began again in her turn to speak and renewed her claims this time threatening to appeal to law. At first Michael listened to her attentively, and when he comprehended her meaning, he gave the child back to its mother. How much do we owe you? asked he. The countrywoman began to reckon up the different expenses, which amounted to nearly thirty francs. The joiner felt to the bottom of his pockets, but could find nothing. His forehead became contracted by frowns. Low curses began to escape him. All of a sudden he rummaged in his breast, drew forth a large watch, and holding it up above his head. Here it is, here's your money, cried he with a joyful laugh, a watch, a good one. I always said it would keep for a drink on a dry day. But it is not I who will drink it, but the young one. Ah, 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 go and sell it for me, neighbor, and if that is not enough, I have my earrings. A hey, Genevieve, take them off for me. The earrings will square all. They shall not say you have been disgraced on account of the child, no. Not even if I must pledge a bit of my flesh, my watch, my earrings, 
and my ring get rid of all of them for me at the goldsmith's. Pay the woman, and let the little fool go to sleep. Give him me, Genevieve, I will put him to bed. And taking the baby from the arms of his mother, he carried him with a firm step to his cradle. It was easy to perceive the change which took place in Michael from this day. He cut all his old drinking acquaintances. He went early every morning to his work, and returned regularly in the evening to finish the day with Genevieve and Robert. Very soon he would not leave them at all, and he hired a place near the fruit shop, and worked in it on his own account. They would soon have been able to live in comfort, had it not been for the expenses which the child required. Everything was given up to his education. He had gone through the regular school training, had studied mathematics, drawing, and the carpenter's trade, and had only begun to work a few months ago. Till now, they had been exhausting every resource which their laborious industry could provide to push him forward in his business. And, happily, all these exertions had not proved useless, the seed had brought forth fruit, and the days of harvest were close by. While I was thus recalling these remembrances to my mind, Michael had come in, and was occupied in fixing shelves where they were wanted. During the time I was writing the notes of my journal, I was also scrutinizing the joiner. The excesses of his youth and the labor of his manhood have deeply marked his face. His hair is thin and gray, his shoulders stoop, his legs are shrunken and slightly bent. There seems a sort of weight in his whole being. His very features have an expression of sorrow and despondency. He answers my questions by monosyllables, and like a man who wishes to avoid conversation. Whence comes this dejection, when one would think he had all he could wish for, I should like to know. Ten o'clock, Michael is just gone downstairs to look for a tool he has forgotten. I have at last succeeded in drawing from him the secret of his and Genevieve's sorrow. Their son Robert is the cause of it. Not that he has turned out ill after all their care, not that he is idle or dissipated. But both were in hopes he would never leave them any more. The presence of the young man was to have renewed and made glad their lives once more. His mother counted the days. His father prepared everything to receive their dear associate in their toils. And at the moment when they were thus about to be repaid for all their sacrifices, Robert had suddenly informed them that he had just engaged himself to a contractor at Versailles. Every remonstrance and every prayer were useless, he brought forward the necessity of initiating himself into all the details of an important contract. The facilities he should have in his new position of improving himself in his trade, and the hopes he had of turning his knowledge to advantage. At last, when his mother, having come to the end of her arguments, began to cry, he hastily kissed her, and went away that he might avoid any further remonstrances. He had been absent a year, and there was nothing to give them hopes of his return. His parents hardly saw him once a month, and then he only stayed a few moments with them. I have been punished where I had hoped to be rewarded, Michael said to me just now. I had wished for a saving and industrious son, and God has given me an ambitious and avaricious one, 
I had always said to myself that when once he was grown up we should have him always with us. To recall our youth and to enliven our hearts, his mother was always thinking of getting him married and having children again to care for. You know women always will busy themselves about others. As for me, I thought of him working near my bench and singing his new songs, for he has learnt music and is one of the best singers at the Orphean. A dream, sir, truly, directly the bird was fledged, he took to flight and remembers neither father nor mother. Yesterday, for instance, was the day we expected him. He should have come to supper with us. No Robert today, either. He has had some plan to finish or some bargain to arrange. And his old parents are put down last in the accounts, after the customers and the joiners work. Ah, if I could have guessed how it would have turned out fool, to have sacrificed my likings and my money, for nearly twenty years, to the education of a thankless son, was it for this I took the trouble to cure myself of drinking, to break with my friends, to become an example to the neighborhood. The jovial good fellow has made a goose of himself. Oh, if I had to begin again, no, no, you see women and children are our bane. They soften our hearts, they lead us a life of hope and affection, we pass a quarter of our lives in fostering the growth of a grain of corn, which is to be everything to us in our old age. And when the harvest time comes good night, the ear is empty. While he was speaking, Michael's voice became hoarse, his eyes fierce, and his lips quivered. I wished to answer him, but I could only think of commonplace consolations, and I remained silent. The joiner pretended he needed a tool and left me, poor father. Ah, I know those moments of temptation when virtue has failed to reward us. And we regret having obeyed her, who has not felt this weakness in hours of trial, and who has not uttered. At least once, the mournful exclamation of Brutus. But if virtue is only a word, what is there then in life that is true and real? No. I will not believe that goodness is in vain. It does not always give the happiness we had hoped for, but it brings some other. In the world everything is ruled by order and has its proper and necessary consequences, and virtue cannot be the sole exception to the general law. If it had been prejudicial to those who practiced it, experience would have avenged them. But experience has, on the contrary, made it more universal and more holy. We only accuse it of being a faithless debtor, because we demand an immediate payment, and one apparent to our senses. We always consider life as a fairy tale, in which every good action must be rewarded by a visible wonder. We do not accept as payment a peaceful conscience, self-content, or a good name among men treasures, that are more precious than any other but the value of which we do not feel till after we have lost them. Michael is come back, and has returned to his work. His son has not yet arrived. By telling me of his hopes and his grievous disappointments, he became excited, he unceasingly went over again the same subject, always adding something to his griefs, he had just wound up his confidential discourse by speaking to me of a joiner's business which he had hoped to buy. 
and worked to good account with Robert's help. The present owner had made a fortune by it, and, after thirty years of business, he was thinking of retiring to one of the ornamental cottages in the outskirts of the city, a usual retreat for the frugal and successful workingmen. Michael had not indeed the two thousand francs which must be paid down, but perhaps he could have persuaded Master Benoit to wait. Robert's presence would have been a security for him, for the young man could not fail to ensure the prosperity of a workshop. Besides science and skill, he had the power of invention and bringing to perfection. His father had discovered among his drawings a new plan for a staircase, which had occupied his thoughts for a long time and he even suspected him of having engaged himself to the Versailles contractor for the very purpose of executing it. The youth was tormented by this spirit of invention, which took possession of all his thoughts, and while devoting his mind to study, he had no time to listen to his feelings. Michael told me all this with a mixed feeling of pride and vexation. I saw he was proud of the son he was abusing, and that his very pride made him more sensitive to that son's neglect. 6 o'clock p.m. I have just finished a happy day. How many events have happened within a few hours, and what a change for Genevieve and Michael. He had just finished fixing the shelves and telling me of his son while I laid the cloth for my breakfast. Suddenly we heard hurried steps in the passage. The door opened, and Genevieve entered with Robert. The joiner gave a start of joyful surprise, but he repressed it immediately, as if he wished to keep up the appearance of displeasure. The young man did not appear to notice it, but threw himself into his arms in an open-hearted manner, which surprised me, Genevieve, whose face shone with happiness, seemed to wish to speak and to restrain herself with difficulty. I told Robert I was glad to see him, and he answered me with ease and civility. I expected you yesterday, said Michael Arout rather dryly. Forgive me, father, replied the young workman but I had business at St. Germain's. I was not able to come back till it was very late, and then the master kept me. The joiner looked at his son sidewise, and then took up his hammer again. All right, muttered he in a grumbling tone, when we are with other people we must do as they wish. But there are some who would like better to eat brown bread with their own knife than partridges with the silver fork of a master. And I am one of those, father, replied Robert, merrily, but, as the proverb says, you must shell the peas before you can eat them. It was necessary that I should first work in a great workshop to go on with your plan of the staircase, interrupted Michael ironically. You must now say Monsieur Raymond's plan, father, replied Robert, smiling. Why? Because I have sold it to him. The joiner, who was planing a board, turned round quickly. Sold it, cried he with sparkling eyes for the reason that I was not rich enough to give it him. Michael threw down the board and tool. There he is again, resumed he angrily. His good genius puts an idea into his head, which would have made him known. And he goes and sells it to a rich man, who will take the honor of it himself. Well, what harm is there done? asked Genevieve. What harm, cried the joiner, in a passion. 
you understand nothing about it you are a woman but he he knows well that a true workman never gives up his own inventions for money no more than a soldier would give up his cross that is his glory he is bound to keep it for the honor it does him ah thunder if i had ever made a discovery rather than put it up at auction i would have sold one of my eyes don't you see that a new invention is like a child to a workman he takes care of it he brings it up he makes a way for it in the world and it is only a poor creature who sells it robert colored a little you will think differently father said he when you know why i sold my plan yes and you will thank him for it added genevieve who could no longer keep silence never replied michael but wretched man cried she he sold it only for our sakes the joiner looked at his wife and son with astonishment it was necessary to come to an explanation the latter related how he had entered into a negotiation with master benoit who had positively refused to sell his business unless one half of the two thousand francs were first paid down it was in the hopes of obtaining this sum that he had gone to work with the contractor at versailles he had had an opportunity of trying his invention and of finding a purchaser thanks to the money he received for it he had just concluded the bargain with benoit and had brought his father the key of the new work yard this explanation was given by the young workman with so much modesty and simplicity that i was quite affected by it genevieve cried michael pressed his son to his heart and in a long embrace he seemed to ask his pardon for having unjustly accused him all was now explained with honor to robert the conduct which his parents had ascribed to indifference really sprang from affection he had neither obeyed the voice of ambition nor of avarice nor even the nobler inspiration of inventive genius his whole motive and single aim had been the happiness of genevieve and michael the day for proving his gratitude had come and he had returned them sacrifice for sacrifice after the explanations and exclamations of joy were over all three were about to leave me but the cloth being laid I added three more places and kept them to breakfast. The meal was prolonged, the fare was only tolerable, but the overflowings of affection made it delicious. Never had I better understood the unspeakable charm of family love. What calm enjoyment in that happiness which is always shared with others! in that community of interests which unites such various feelings in that association of existences which forms one single being of so many what is man without those home affections which like so many roots fix him firmly in the earth and permit him to imbibe all the juices of life energy happiness do not all these come from them without family life where would man learn to love to associate to deny himself a community in little is it not this which teaches us how to live in the great one such is the holiness of home that to express our relation with god we have been obliged to borrow the words invented for our family life men have named themselves the sons of a heavenly father ah let us carefully preserve these chains of domestic union do not let us unbind the human sheaf 
and scatter its ears to all the caprices of chance and of the winds. But let us rather enlarge this holy law. Let us carry the principles and the habits of home beyond set bounds. And, if it may be, let us realize the prayer of the Apostle of the Gentiles when he exclaimed to the newborn children of Christ, Be ye like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Etext Editor's Bookmarks Always to mistake feeling for evidence, fame and power are gifts, that our dearly bought fortune sells what we believe she gives make himself a name. He becomes public property, my patronage has become her property, not desirous to teach goodness, power of necessity, progress can never be forced on without danger, so much confidence at first. So much doubt at loss the man in power gives up his peace, virtue made friends, but she did not take pupils, we are not bound to live while we are bound to do our duty. An Attic Philosopher on Philosoph Sue's Less Toits By Emile Sylvester, Book 3, Chapter X, Our Country, October 12th, 7 o'clock A. M. The nights are already become cold and long. The sun, shining through my curtains, no more wakens me long before the hour for work. And even when my eyes are open, the pleasant warmth of the bed keeps me fast under my counterpane. Every morning there begins a long argument between my activity and my indolence, and, snugly wrapped up to the eyes, I wait like the Gaskin until they have succeeded in coming to an agreement. This morning, however, a light which shone from my door upon my pillow, awoke me earlier than usual. In vain I turned on my side. The persevering light, like a victorious enemy, pursued me into every position. At last, quite out of patience, I sat up and hurled my nightcap to the foot of the bed. I will observe, by way of parenthesis, that the various evolutions of this Pacific headgear seem to have been from the remotest time symbols of the vehement emotions of the mind, for our language has borrowed its most common images from them. But be this as it may, I got up in a very bad humor, grumbling at my new neighbor, who took it into his head to be wakeful when I wished to sleep. We are all made thus, we do not understand, that others may live on their own account. Each one of us is like the earth, according to the old system of Ptolemy, and thinks he can have the whole universe revolve around himself. On this point, to make use of the metaphor alluded to, two's less hums on Latite Dan's Lamine Bonnet, I had for the time being, as I have already said, thrown mine to the other end of my bed. And I slowly disengaged my legs from the warm bedclothes, while making a host of evil reflections upon the inconvenience of having neighbors. For more than a month I had not had to complain of those whom chance had given me. Most of them only came in to sleep and went away again on rising. I was almost always alone on this top story, alone with the clouds and the sparrows. But at Paris nothing lasts. The current of life carries us along, like the seaweed torn from the rock. The houses are vessels which take mere passengers. How many different faces have I already seen pass along the landing place belonging to our attics? How many companions of a few days have disappeared forever? Some are lost in that medley of the living which whirls continually under the scourge of necessity. And others in that resting place of the dead, 
who sleep under the hand of God. Peter the bookbinder is one of these last. Wrapped up in selfishness, he lived alone and friendless, and he died as he had lived. His loss was neither mourned by any one, nor disarranged anything in the world. And an attic emptied in our house. It is the same which my new neighbor has inhabited for the last few days. To say truly now that I am quite awake, and my ill humor is gone with my nightcap to say truly, this new neighbor, although rising earlier than suits my idleness, is not the less a very good man, he carries his misfortunes. As few know how to carry their good fortunes with cheerfulness and moderation. But fate has cruelly tried him. Father Schoffer is but the wreck of a man. In the place of one of his arms hangs an empty sleeve. His left leg is made by the turner, and he drags the right along with difficulty. But above these ruins rises a calm and happy face while looking upon his countenance, radiant with a serene energy. While listening to his voice, the tone of which has, so to speak, the accent of goodness, we see that the soul has remained entire in the half-destroyed covering. The fortress is a little damaged, as Father Schoffer says, but the garrison is quite hearty. Decidedly, the more I think of this excellent man, the more I reproach myself for the sort of malediction I bestowed on him when I awoke. We are generally too indulgent in our secret wrongs toward our neighbor. All ill will which does not pass the region of thought seems innocent to us, and with our clumsy justice. We excuse without examination the sin which does not betray itself by action. But are we then bound to others only by the enforcement of laws? Besides these external relations, is there not a real relation of feeling between men? Do we not owe to all those who live under the same heaven as ourselves, the aid not only of our acts but of our purposes? Ought not every human life to be to us like a vessel, that we accompany with our prayers for a happy voyage. It is not enough that men do not harm one another. They must also help and love one another. The papal benediction, urbi et orbi, should be the constant cry from all hearts. To condemn him who does not deserve it, even in the mind, even by a passing thought, that which has established the union of souls here below, and to which Christ has given the sweet name of charity. These thoughts came into my mind as I finished dressing, and I said to myself that Father Schoffer had a right to reparation from me, to make amends for the feeling of ill will I had against him just now, I owed him some explicit proof of sympathy. I heard him humming a tune in his room. He was at work, and I determined that I would make the first neighborly call. 8 o'clock p.m. I found Father Schoffer at a table lighted by a little smoky lamp, without a fire, although it is already cold, and making large pasteboard boxes. He was humming a popular song in a low tone. I had hardly entered the room when he uttered an exclamation of surprise and pleasure. A, hey, is it you, neighbor, come in then? I did not think you got up so early, so I put a damper on my music. I was afraid of waking you, excellent man, while I was sending him to the devil he was putting himself out of his way for me. This thought touched me and I paid my compliments on his having become my neighbor with a warmth which opened his heart. 
Faith, you seem to me to have the look of a good Christian, said he in a voice of soldier-like cordiality. And shaking me by the hand, I do not like those people who look on a landing place as a frontier line and treat their neighbors as if they were Cossacks. When men snuff the same air and speak the same lingo, they are not meant to turn their backs to each other. Sit down there, neighbor. I don't mean to order you. Only take care of the stool. It has but three legs. And we must put good will in place of the fourth. It seems that that is a treasure which there is no want of here. I observed, good will, repeated chauffeur, that is all my mother left me, and I take it no son has received a better inheritance. Therefore they used to call me Monsieur Content in the batteries. You are a soldier, then. I served in the Third Artillery under the Republic, and afterward in the Guard. Through all the commotions, I was at Jemaps and at Waterloo, so I was at the christening and at the burial of our glory. As one may say, I looked at him with astonishment. And how old were you then at Jemaps? asked I. Somewhere about fifteen, said he, how came you to think of being a soldier so early? I did not really think about it. I then worked at toy-making, and never dreamed that France would ask me for anything else than to make her draft boards, shuttlecocks, and cups and balls. But I had an old uncle at Vincennes whom I went to see from time to time a Fontenoy veteran in the same rank of life as myself, but with ability enough to have risen to that of a marshal. Unluckily, in those days there was no way for common people to get on. My uncle, whose services would have got him made a prince under the other, had then retired with the mere rank of sub-lieutenant. But you should have seen him in his uniform, his cross of St. Louis, his wooden leg, his white moustaches, and his noble countenance. You would have said he was a portrait of one of those old heroes in powdered hair which are at Versailles. Every time I visited him, he said something which remained fixed in my memory. But, one day, I found him quite grave, Jerome, said he, should owe you know what is going on on the frontier. No, Lieutenant, replied I well, resumed he, our country is in danger. I did not well understand him, and yet it seemed something to me, Perhaps you have never thought what your country means, continued he, placing his hand on my shoulder. It is all that surrounds you, all that has brought you up and fed you, all that you have loved. These houses, these trees, those girdles who go along there laughing, this is your country, the laws which protect you the bread which pays for your work, the words you interchange with others, the joy and grief which come to you from the men and things among which you live, this is your country, the little room where you used to see your mother, the remembrances she has left you, the earth where she rests, this is your country, you see it, you breathe it. Everywhere think to yourself, my son, of your rights and your duties, your affections and your wants, your past and your present blessings, write them all under a single name, and that name will be your country. I was trembling with emotion, and great tears were in my eyes. Ah, I understand, cried I, it is our home in large, 
It is that part of the world where God has placed our body and our soul. You are right, Jerome, continued the old soldier, so you comprehend also what we owe it. Truly, resumed I, we owe it all that we are. It is a question of love. And of honesty, my son, concluded he, the member of a family who does not contribute his share of work, and of happiness fails in his duty, and is a bad kinsman, the member of a partnership who does not enrich it with all his might, with all his courage, and with all his heart defrauds it of what belongs to it, and is a dishonest man. It is the same with him who enjoys the advantages of having a country, and does not accept the burdens of it. He forfeits his honor, and is a bad citizen. And what must one do, lieutenant, to be a good citizen? Asked I. Do for your country what you would do for your father and mother, said he. I did not answer at the moment. My heart was swelling, and the blood boiling in my veins. But, on returning along the road, my uncle's words were, so to speak, written up before my eyes. I repeated, Do for your country what you would do for your father and mother. And my country is in danger, an enemy attacks it, while I, I turn cups and balls. This thought tormented me so much all night that the next day I returned to Vincent's to announce to the lieutenant that I had just enlisted and was going off to the frontier. The brave man pressed upon me his cross of St. Louis, and I went away as proud as an ambassador. That is how, neighbor, I became a volunteer under the Republic before I had cut my wisdom teeth. All this was told quietly, and in the cheerful spirit of him who looks upon an accomplished duty neither as a merit nor a grievance. While he spoke, Father Schoffer grew animated, not on account of himself, but of the general subject. Evidently that which occupied him in the drama of life was not his own part, but the drama itself. This sort of disinterestedness touched me. I prolonged my visit, and showed myself as frank as possible. In order to win his confidence in return, in an hour's time he knew my position and my habits. I was on the footing of an old acquaintance. I even confessed the ill humor the light of his lamp put me into a short time before. He took what I said with the touching cheerfulness which comes from a heart in the right place, and which looks upon everything on the good side. He neither spoke to me of the necessity which obliged him to work while I could sleep, nor of the deprivations of the old soldier compared to the luxury of the young clerk. He only struck his forehead, accused himself of thoughtlessness, and promised to put list round his door. O great and beautiful soul, with whom nothing turns to bitterness, and who art peremptory only in duty and benevolence. October 15th. This morning I was looking at a little engraving I had framed myself, and hung over my writing table. It is a design of Gavarni's, in which, in a grave mood, he has represented a veteran and a conscript. By often contemplating these two figures, so different in expression, and so true to life, both have become living in my eyes. I have seen them move, I have heard them speak. The picture has become a real scene, at which I am present as spectator. The veteran advances slowly, his hand leaning on the shoulder of the young soldier. 
His eyes closed forever, no longer perceived the sun shining through the flowering chestnut trees. In the place of his right arm hangs an empty sleeve, and he walks with a wooden leg, the sound of which on the pavement makes those who pass turn to look. At the sight of this ancient wreck from our patriotic wars, the greater number shake their heads in pity, and I seem to hear a sigh or an imprecation. See the worth of glory, says a portly merchant, turning away his eyes in horror. What a deplorable use of human life, rejoins a young man who carries a volume of philosophy under his arm. The trooper would better not have left his plough, adds a countryman, with a cunning air. Poor old man, murmurs a woman, almost crying. The veteran has heard, and he knits his brow. For it seems to him that his guide has grown thoughtful. The latter, attracted by what he hears around him, hardly answers the old man's questions, and his eyes, vaguely lost in space, seem to be seeking there for the solution of some problem. I seem to see a twitching in the gray mustaches of the veteran. He stops abruptly, and holding back his guide with his remaining arm, They all pity me, says he, because they do not understand it. But if I were to answer them, what would you say to them, father? asks the young man with curiosity. I should say first to the woman who weeps when she looks at me, to keep her tears for other misfortunes. For each of my wounds calls to mind some struggle for my colors. There is room for doubting how some men have done their duty. With me it is visible. I carry the account of my services, written with the enemy's steel and lead, on myself. To pity me for having done my duty is to suppose I would better have been false to it. And what would you say to the countryman, father? I should tell him that, to drive the plough in peace, we must first secure the country itself, and that, as long as there are foreigners ready to eat our harvest, there must be arms to defend it. But the young student, too, shook his head when he lamented such a use of life, because he does not know what self-sacrifice and suffering can teach. The books that he studies we have put in practice, though we never read them. The principles he applauds we have defended with powder and bayonet. And at the price of your limbs and your blood, the merchant said, when he saw your maimed body, see the worth of glory. Do not believe him, my son. The true glory is the bread of the soul. Patience and courage. The master of all has bestowed it as a tie the more between men. When we desire to be distinguished by our brethren, do we not thus prove our esteem and our sympathy for them? A longing for admiration is but one side of love. No, no, the true glory can never be too dearly paid for, that which we should deplore, child is not the infirmities which prove a generous self-sacrifice, but those which our vices or our imprudence have called forth. Ah, if I could speak aloud to those who, when passing, cast looks of pity upon me, 
I should say to the young man whose excesses have dimmed his sight before he is old. What have you done with your eyes? To the slothful man, who with difficulty drags along his enervated mass of flesh. What have you done with your feet? To the old man, who is punished for his intemperance by the gout. What have you done with your hands? To all. What have you done with the days God granted you, with the faculties you should have employed for the good of your brethren, if you cannot answer? Bestow no more of your pity upon the old soldier maimed in his country's cause, for he he at least can show his scars without shame. October 16th The little engraving has made me comprehend better the merits of Father Schoffer and I therefore esteem him all the more. He has just now left my attic. There no longer passes a single day without his coming to work by my fire, or my going to sit and talk by his board. The old artilleryman has seen much, and likes to tell of it. For twenty years he was an armed traveler throughout Europe, and he fought without hatred, for he was possessed by a single thought the honor of the national flag. It might have been his superstition. If you will, but it was, at the same time, his safeguard. The word France, which was then resounding so gloriously through the world, served as a talisman to him against all sorts of temptation. To have to support a great name may seem a burden to vulgar minds, but it is an encouragement to vigorous ones. I, too, have had many moments, said he to me the other day, when I have been tempted to make friends with the devil. War is not precisely the school for rural virtues. By dint of burning, destroying, and killing, you grow a little tough as regards your feelings. And, when the bayonet has made you king, the notions of an autocrat come into your head a little strongly. But at these moments I called to mind that country which the lieutenant spoke of to me, and I whispered to myself the well-known phrase, Tauger's Francais, it has been laughed at since. People who would make a joke of the death of their mother have turned it into ridicule. As if the name of our country was not also a noble and a binding thing. For my part, I shall never forget from how many follies the title of Frenchman has kept me. When, overcome with fatigue, I have found myself in the rear of the colors, and when the musketry was rattling in the front ranks. Many a time I heard a voice, which whispered in my ear, Leave the others to fight, and for today take care of your own hide. But then, that word Francais murmured within me, and I pressed forward to help my comrades. At other times, when, irritated by hunger, cold, and wounds, I have arrived at the hovel of some main hair, I have been seized by an itching to break the master's back and to burn his hut, but I whispered to myself, Frank eyes, and this name would not rhyme with either incendiary or murderer. I have, in this way, passed through kingdoms from east to west, and from north to south, always determined not to bring disgrace upon my country's flag. The lieutenant, you see, had taught me a magic word, my country. Not only must we defend it, but we must also make it great and loved. October 17th. Today I have paid my neighbor a long visit. A chance expression led the way to his telling me more of himself than he had yet done. I asked him whether both his limbs had been lost in the same battle. 
No, no, replied he, the cannon only took my leg. It was the clamart quarries that my arm went to feed. And when I asked him for the particulars, that's as easy as to say good morning, continued he. After the great break-up at Waterloo, I stayed three months in the camp hospital to give my wooden leg time to grow. As soon as I was able to hobble a little, I took leave of headquarters and took the road to Paris, where I hoped to find some relative or friend. But no, all were gone or underground. I should have found myself less strange at Vienna, Madrid, or Berlin. And although I had a leg the less to provide for, I was none the better off. My appetite had come back. And my last sous were taking flight. I had indeed met my old colonel, who recollected that I had helped him out of the skirmish at Montereau by giving him my horse. And he had offered me bed and board at his house. I knew that the year before he had married a castle and no few farms. So that I might become permanent coat brusher to a millionaire, which was not without its temptations. It remained to see if I had not anything better to do. One evening I set myself to reflect upon it. Let us see, chauffeur, said I to myself. The question is to act like a man. The colonel's place suits you, but cannot you do anything better? Your body is still in good condition. And your arms strong, do you not owe all your strength to your country? As your Vincent's uncle said, why not leave some old soldier, more cut up than you are, to get his hospital at the colonel's? Come, trooper, you are still fit for another stout charge or two. You must not lay up before your time. Whereupon I went to thank the colonel and to offer my services to an old artilleryman who had gone back to his home at Clamart and who had taken up the quarryman's pick again. For the first few months, I played the conscript's part, that is to say. There was more stir than work, but with a good will one gets the better of stones, as of everything else. I did not become so to speak, the leader of a column, but I brought up the rank among the good workmen, and I ate my bread with a good appetite, seeing I had earned it with a good will. For even underground, you see, I still kept my pride. The thought that I was working to do my part in changing rocks into houses pleased my heart. I said to myself, Courage, chauffeur, my old boy, you are helping to beautify your country. And that kept up my spirit. Unfortunately, some of my companions were rather too sensible to the charms of the brandy bottle. So much so, that one day one of them, who could hardly distinguish his right hand from his left, thought proper to strike a light close to a charged mine. The mine exploded suddenly and sent a shower of stone grape among us, which killed three men, and carried away the arm of which I have now only the sleeve. So you were again without means of living, said I to the old soldier. That is to say, I had to change them, replied he quietly. The difficulty was to find one which would do with five fingers instead of ten. I found it, however. How was that? Among the Paris street sweepers, what, you have been one? Of the pioneers of the health force for a while, neighbor, and that was not my worst time either. The corps of sweepers is not so low as it is dirty, I can tell you. 
There are old actresses in it who could never learn to save their money. And ruined merchants from the exchange, we even had a professor of classics, who for a little drink would recite Latin to you. Or Greek tragedies as you chose. They could not have competed for the Munthian prize. But we excused faults on account of poverty, and cheered our poverty by our good humor and jokes. I was as ragged and as cheerful as the rest, while trying to be something better. Even in the mire of the gutter I preserved my faith that nothing is dishonorable which is useful to our country. Chauffeur, said I to myself with a smile after the sword, the hammer after the hammer, the broom. You are going downstairs, my old boy, but you are still serving your country. However, you ended by leaving your new profession, said I. A reform was required, neighbor. The street sweepers seldom have their feet dry and the damp at last made the wounds in my good leg open again. I could no longer follow the regiment, and it was necessary to lay down my arms. It is now two months since I left off working in the sanitary department of Paris. At the first moment I was daunted. Of my four limbs, I had now only my right hand, and even that had lost its strength. So it was necessary to find some gentlemanly occupation for it. After trying a little of everything, I fell upon card box making, and here I am at cases for the lace and buttons of the National Guard. It is work of little profit, but it is within the capacity of all. By getting up at four and working till eight, I earn sixty-five centimes. My lodging and bowl of soup take fifty of them. And there are three sous over for luxuries. So I am richer than France herself, for I have no deficit in my budget. And I continue to serve her, as I save her lace and buttons. At these words, Father Chauffeur looked at me with a smile, and with his great scissors began cutting the green paper again for his cardboard cases. My heart was touched, and I remained lost in thought. Here is still another member of that sacred phalanx who, in the battle of life, always march in front for the example and the salvation of the world, each of these brave soldiers has his war cry. For this one it is country, for that home, for a third mankind, but they all follow the same standard that of duty. For all the same divine law reigns, that of self-sacrifice. To love something more than one's self, that is the secret of all that is great, to know how to live for others that is the aim of all noble souls. Chapter Roman 11 Moral Use of Inventories November 13th, 9 o'clock p. M. I had well stopped up the chinks of my window. My little carpet was nailed down in its place. My lamp, provided with its shade, cast a subdued light around, and my stove made a low, murmuring sound, as if some live creature was sharing my hearth with me. All was silent around me, but out of doors the snow and rain swept the... Thanks for watching this video book is provided by Streambooks.